taxes. I was talking to Linda about growing up in suburban Chicago in the 1950s, in the good old days. She said to me, weren't taxes kind of high back then? I said, I don't know, I wasn't paying taxes. But then I did check them out. And uh, yeah, remember, the top marginal rate was 91%. Uh, things are a lot better now. Uh, thanks largely to some of our real heroes, I think, like Jack Kemp, the late Jack Kemp, the late Billy Steiger, Kemp Roth, Ronald Reagan, the big Reagan tax cut, what Bob Bartley did then at the Wall Street Journal in terms of keeping the momentum going for the, what he called the seven fat years in his book, down through, uh, by that time, uh, the big four were in place, Laffer, Cudlow, Moore, and who am I forgetting? Laffer, Moore, Cudlow, um, Forbes. Forbes, my God. <laughs> yeah. Better watch it, that's my own trustee. <laughs> and as Steve and he, will point He's the godfather of the whole thing, right? Well, he, yeah, and his 1996 book was certainly yeah, important. Exactly. On through what happened then to um, the 90s, the Kemp Commission, remember the Kemp Commission mm -hmm. on tax reform? And I had the, the, the good fortune, I guess, of being the vice chairman of that commission. And a year later, when uh, Jack was picked by Bob Dole, uh, he asked me to come on board as in the campaign when he was vice, uh, running for vice president and serve as his chief of staff. So that was the only time I left Heritage in those 37 years. And, uh, after three months of doing that, not very successfully, I reported at the next President's Club meeting of Heritage that I'd learned a couple lessons. One, one was uh, never regret, but two was never repeat. Uh, that was, it was enough of that for the politician side. Uh, then, you know, on through Clinton years, George W. two tax cuts. Obama will skip that period. <laughs> Uh, and uh, here we are, Steve, pick it up. Uh, where did we, how did we get here? Or how did we get Trump on our side? And uh, what, what happened during the campaign? And sure. take it over from there. Well, yeah. first of all, I mean, let me just start with the headline here. And this is um, absolutely true that, um, well, two, two important things. First of all, the tax cut is arguably the biggest victory for the conservative movement in 30 years. This is a gigantic victory for our side. So that's number one. Number two, it would not have happened without the Heritage Foundation. There's just no question about it. So thank you all for making this amazing thing happen. And you know, you're recounting that history of what happened, because I got involved in this game in the early 80s when Reagan was, uh, was elected. Um, the last big tax reform we had in this country was 1986. So it had been 30 years since we'd done anything in a positive direction on taxes. And we had Heritage, and I was at Cato for a while, and at the Wall Street Journal editorial page, we've been writing and doing all of this research for years mm -hmm. after year after year. I mean, we had papers two feet high of all the research showing the importance of cutting marginal tax rates and why this would raise revenues, improve the economy. And you know, at some point, you almost just want to throw up your hands and say, well, why do we keep doing this? But I mean, it was basically 30 years of research that really paid off. So sometimes when you think, you know, gee, is, is anybody listening or is this having any uh, impact? It's a, a long process but, but, um, from the time of the ideas till they get enacted into law. So thank you for Heritage for just keeping at the game and, and keeping pounding at this. So how did it happen? So, um, it was about almost exactly two years ago, Ed, that I first met, met uh, Donald Trump. Mm. Um, almost exactly two years ago, and I have to say, at the time when I went to go see him, and by the way, is it great news or what that Larry Kudlow is the chief yeah. economist for Donald Trump? I mean, that is the most amazing thing. Uh, and so Larry, Larry is one of my best friends. He was the be best man at my wedding, for goodness sake, so I love Larry Kudlow, and there's nobody who could better be serving our president um, uh, and our country than, than Larry in that role. But anyway, we went to go see Trump, and I had a, you know, uh, Corey Lewandowski, you probably, uh, Corey's gonna go down the history books, he's one of the guys who really, um, you know, uh, got Trump through the uh, primaries, and I didn't have a positive opinion of Trump, but we went into the meeting because he had asked us to uh, meet, and, uh, I, and we talked about taxes, and we talked about all this stuff, and he got it. 
I mean, he just, mm -hmm. uh, you know, he's not a scholar, but he's a, and he's not even a conservative. He's just a common sense guy. And the good news is most of what we believe in, right, Kate, is just common sense. So if you have common sense and you're pro-business, um, you know, these things aren't hard to explain. And so what I thought I'd do is just spend like five minutes just kind of going through some of the research we've done at Heritage. These are, most of these slides I'm going to show you are exactly the things when we sat down with Trump uh, and also members of Congress we showed. So, um, you know, I'll show you, um, I'll just go through these very quickly. And again, um, we laid these down right in front of uh, Trump and he got it instantly. So this is basically why are people so angry? You know, why, when, when we were on the campaign, people were asking, gee, you know, why is, why is everybody so angry? Why are, you know, everything's so good in America? Well, yeah, if you lived in Washington, D.C., or if you lived on Silicon Valley, or if you lived in Hollywood or Wall Street, things were really good. But you got out of those places, and you went to Michigan, Ohio, Pennsylvania, West Virginia, Kentucky, states like that. You know, I remember on the campaign ad, I'd ask people, you know, like in Michigan, how is the, how is the recovery going for you? You know what people would say? What recovery what are you talking about? Yeah. So yeah. there were whole, there was at least half the country that just didn't feel like the country was going in, in the right direction economically. This shows you why. You know, the economy grew at 15% during the um, seven and a half year recovery under Obama. I'm just comparing recoveries. And then, you know, the average recovery, because we had nine recessions since the end of World War II, that's the light blue line, 29%. So the economy grew twice as fast during a normal recovery than it did uh, under Obama. And then, of course, under Reagan, uh, you can see the vast difference. The economy grew two and a half times faster. And, you know, I love this natural experiment because, you know, Reagan's philosophy is cut taxes, cut regulations. You know, as you all recall from his famous debate with Jimmy Carter when he said government is not the solution, government is the problem. Um, you know, so that was the Reagan philosophy. I mean, of course, Obama philosophy was whatever the problem is, there's a government solution. And so you couldn't find two presidents who had more diametrically opposite views. And you can see what happened. The economy grew twice, two and a half times faster. And why does that matter? Because it means that by the year 2016, because of this really anemic, flimsy recovery we had under Obama, the, econ the economy was about $3 trillion smaller than it should have been. So in other words, if we had had a Reagan-style expansion rather than this flimsy Obama recovery, the economy today would be $3 trillion dollars larger. Now that's a gigantic number, right? That's the combined GDP of Michigan, Ohio, Pennsylvania combined. And people felt it. And the other related factor was that wages and salaries for middle class Americans really had not grown very much at all for the 15 years. And they felt it. So that's that. Then this is the other thing that I think was the, the heart of what Trump was trying to do. And I remember I showed this to uh, Larry and I put this together for Trump. And I think it's instructive. It's still very instructive about what we need to do to turn around an economy. You heard earlier today from Romina about the, 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 the bleak budget picture that we have right now. Um, and most of you in this room, I'm sure everybody in this room is very concerned about the national debt. But if you look at this national debt picture, this is from the CBO, and it's, it's the, the, the history of our debt as a share of GDP, because when you measure these things, you want to measure the debt as a share of your asset size. But if you look at the projection, you know, that's a scary picture. Right? Right? If we have ended up at 150% of GDP in 20 years, we would be like Greece and, and uh, Puerto Rico uh, and, uh, and Detroit. And so that's bankruptcy territory. So that can't happen. And so we started looking at why is it, what's dri driving these grim numbers on our budget? Well, it turns out there's two things. One is the, obviously the demographic situation of the aging of the pop uh, population. Not a lot we can do about that. But the other thing was that the CBO has been projecting, and by the way, they just came out with a new report a week ago that repeats these numbers, that they're projecting the economy will grow 1.9% over the next 10, 15, 20 years. And what we said to Trump is, no, we've got to grow the economy much faster than that. And when people ask me, what's at the heart of Trumponomics, I would make the case you had it's about growing the economy at a faster rate of growth. Because if you do that, the blue line there shows you if you get faster growth, then instead of the budget looking like a disaster, we can actually um, reduce our debt burden. So that, that was something that Trump uh, understood. I'll skip that. Um, I'll skip that. Um, I, I just thought I, the other thing we, we pointed out to him was states because, and we've done so much research at mm -hmm. Heritage on this, that, you know, if you don't think tax rates matter, then why is it that the low tax states are doing so much better than the high tax states? I mean, this is another great experiment. So, you know, we just looked at the four largest states. Now, how many of you in this room, I think a lot of, how many of you live in Florida or Texas? Raise your hand. Most of you in this room do. Uh, how many of you live in New York and California? 
I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, you know, so New York and California are uh, really in bad shape right now. And they've, uh, they have a, anybody know what the highest tax rate is in Texas and Florida? Zero. Zero. There's no income tax. Cal New York and California at 13%. And you can see what the impact has been, that Texas and Florida each, well, Texas gained a million and a half people, not net over the last 10 years, an amazing st success story. Florida has gained 800,000, and more and more are coming all the time. And that, that's on net. That's 800,000 more people moved in Florida than moved out of Florida. And then New York and California are just disaster areas. New York will, has lost 1.4 million people over the last decade. California has lost 1.1 million. How do you how do you screw up California? I mean, you know, how, you've got to make pe to people want to leave California, um, and yet it's happening. And it's, it's happening in no small part because of the tax burden. So there's that. Now, um, the heart of the matter is, and I'll just kind of stop with this because we've got a lot to talk about. Um, we believe that lower tax rates matter. You know, as uh, Art Laffer and the Wall Street Journal editorial board has taught us over the years, that what you want from a good tax system, sorry, that's Nancy Pelosi. Um, <laughs> she's trying to, sorry about that. Um, you want to, um, by the way, my friends, my kids get the biggest kick out of this thing. They're like, this is the lungs in the, in the uh, Smithsonian. Uh, okay, so if you look at the, um, the blue line, that's just the highest tax rate in the United States, is exactly what you were just talking about, Ed. When Reagan came into office, the highest income tax rate was 70%. You know, that means for every additional dollar you're making, the government's getting 70 cents, and you only get to keep 30 cents. So that have very, you know, as the journal and Camp Jack Kemp and Reagan made the case, this was a smothering investment uh, in job creation. And so, you, you know, look what Reagan did. I mean, that's an amazing. Where is that? Is Ed Meese in here? Where are you, Ed? I mean, what you guys did on taxes was the most spectacular thing. I mean, from 70 to how did you do that? Uh, and a, a miracle, a miracle. But look at what happened. I mean, I don't know if you've seen this before, Ed. Look what happened to the share of taxes paid by the rich. They didn't go down, they went up. The rich paid more taxes at a 28% rate than they did at a 70% rate. I mean, is there any better, uh, you know, um, illustration of the Laffer curve in action? That, that, uh, and, that, and again, Trump got that too. If we lower tax rates, we're going to get more uh, enterprise and more uh, business. And uh, many of you have seen me speak. I show this every speech I give because it's my favorite quote from <laughs> modern history. If you haven't seen it before, most of you probably have. I'll just quote again. It's a paradox of truth that tax rates are too high and tax revenues are too low. The soundest way to raise the revenues in the long run is to cut the rates now. I mean, is that beautiful or what? Um, by the way, John F. Kennedy would, would be a Republican today. There's no question about it. He was pro-free trade. He was pro, he was pro tax cut. He was pro strong defense. Um, how many Democrats believe that today? Not, not many. So that's a sad thing. Uh, okay. And then finally, and I'll just kind of end with this because this really is the uh, this really is the heart of the plan. We believe that our business tax system was incredibly deficient. And it was, you probably couldn't come up with anything dumber than what we had um, over the last 15 years with our business tax system. We were truly, you know, as I used to say to members of Congress, it was almost like a head start program for every country we were competing with. Uh, and you can see this is the chart. I think Trump loved this. And we showed him the black line is the U.S. corporate rate, which we had not cut for uh, 25, 30 years since Reagan. We hadn't cut the corporate rate. We were up at 40%. And then those green pillars, those are all of the countries that we compete with. Those are the average rates mm -hmm. of every nation we compete with. Look at that. Down, 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 down. Every single year they were cutting their rates. Uh, you know, that's, uh, that's you know, Spain and Italy and France and Germany and Australia and China and Mexico. All the countries we're competing with. And, and they went down and down and down. So much so by 2015-16, we're at 40% and the rest of the world's at 20 right? And this just, it would, it was almost like we were putting a tariff on our own goods and services. And so the result of this, as most of you know, was that these companies were leaving. They were leaving big time. We saw Burger King and Medtronix, Johnson Controls, Pfizer wanted to leave, and they were leaving because they could get a much lower rate. But anybody in this room know what country has the lowest corporate tax rate of all the industrialized countries? Ireland, yeah, you, you guys know this. Ireland's at 12.5%, we're at 40. Mm -hmm. I was in Dublin uh, about six months ago. It's booming. It's booming. Mm -hmm. Dublin mm -hmm. is booming, and every second or third company is an American, an American company, company that moved yeah. out of the United States. So we had, to, we had to change this. Now, here's a cool story about Trump. So when we showed him this chart, he said, I want 15%. He goes, I want, and Larry and I are looking at each other like, we were thinking 20. But <laughs> if he wants 15, we'll take it. And so... He was unwavering on that mm -hmm. number. I mean, for throughout the whole two-year period, he was unwavering, 15, 15, 15. 
And we said, okay, you know, Mr. President, 15%. Now, why is that important? Because if he had started at 20, we would have got, he, if you want to understand Donald Trump, you have to read his book, The Art of the Deal. Deal. This is the best negotiator I have ever seen. He stuck with 15, that's how we got 20. And if we had started at 20, we would have been 25 or 26. I mean, this isn't that complicated, but most politicians <laughs> don't get this stuff. So the long and short is that we got the rate down to 21%. Um, we've gone from worst to basically first. This is causing massive, massive positive repercussions already. I, I was actually at um, Mar-a-Lago two weeks ago. I saw Trump and I just, you know, just had two minutes with him, but he just, he was, so, he was Steve, can you believe this tax cut? It's unbelievable. Uh, that's the way he is. But, you know, uh, I, I, so I told him, I said, sir, this is happening. This is working even better than we thought. Yeah. And I'll just give you like two quick anecdotes and I'll stop. Um, the biggest story of the year economically, I don't think there's any question about it, is what happened three weeks after we passed the tax cut, and that's the Apple story. Apple, you, you all know this, Apple, um, by the way, I'm gonna just stop and say that two weeks before the tax cut passed, I was on CNN, because I'm with fake news now, and so I was on CNN, and I was, um, I was debating this economist from the left, and uh, I said, I believe that if we pass this tax cut, that Apple will bring 100 to 150 billion dollars back to the United States. They'll repatriate this capital, and both the host of the show, Aaron Burnett, and this other liberal guy, Robert Reich, you know Robert Reich, and they were like, <laughs> "Steve Moore is lying. He doesn't know what he's talking about. He's exaggerating." Blah blah blah. Well, it turns out I did not know what I was talking about because, ladies and gentlemen, Apple did not bring 150 billion dollars back. They brought 350 billion dollars back, in. <laughs> and that that alone, that alone. Would, would justify the tax cut. 35, th uh, $350 billion, they're going to pay $39 billion of taxes that we wouldn't have gotten, and they're building a new campus with something like you know uh, uh, 25,000 workers. Um, I could just go through the list. Costco, Walmart, yeah. Federal Express, uh, Wells Fargo, um, all of these companies are increasing their wages, increasing their salaries. Walmart and Costco, in response to the tax cut, Ed, raised their starting wage to $13 an hour, which is what we've been saying in Heritage for years. You don't need a federal minimum wage. You need, you need pro-growth policies that yeah. will cause companies yeah. to raise their wages. So it's been a phenomenal success. And now we have to, now we have to fight Ed, as an institute here at Heritage to be the guardians of this tax cut because the left is going after it. So I'll stop there. It's a great story. It's a great story. <clears throat> Steve, you went from uh, the summer of 16 uh, to January of 18 pretty quick. Uh, okay, you got the president on board. Yep. Then you worked during the campaign. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I took, a leave. I, I took a leave of absence for three months. Uh, from Heritage, uh, as, as you did uh, during, in the uh, 96 campaign. <laughs> yeah, and, you had better luck than I did. <laughs> right. uh, you know, I always tell people, you know, please don't tell my wife I said this, but election night 2016 was probably the best night of my life. Um, but, um, you know, it was, uh, <laughs> it was a lot of fun. I mean, I, and be, working on a presidential campaign, as you know, it yeah. is, it, you really get to, you get to see the country when you uh, do that. Uh, but it is a lot more fun when you win than when you lose. <laughs> But yeah. Uh, but yeah, no, no, Trump was, I mean, I think what happened was we basically kept selling this idea, lower tax rates. By the way, I meant to, I forgot to mention, one of the things Trump always said every time we met with them is, look, Larry and Steve, I get it, we want to cut the corporate tax rate, but he said, this has to be for every small business in America yeah, as well. Yeah, so yeah. there's 27 million small, how many of you in this room run a S corp or a small business? I mean, a lot of you do. So every small business is going to get that tax cut. Two, we've cut the top rate. Ron Johnson from Wisconsin was a hero here, Ed, because mm -hmm. when we passed the original bill out of the House, Ron Johnson looked at it and said, there's nothing in here for small business. And we looked at it and he's like, he's right. You know, we yeah, had left yeah. small business out. So he got that additional provision. So we cut the top rate from small businesses from 40 to 30 percent. And that's the corporate rate went to um, we got uh, 21 percent on that. Yeah. Um, I'll just tell you one quick story about okay. how Heritage had a big impact on this. So this was always how do you, just like on the health care debate, how do you get to 50 votes in the Senate, right? It was always going to come down to that. We knew we mm -hmm. could get it through the House. And the last three weeks, oh, my God, I mean, it was we were so nervous about this. And you know, we knew that we, we had a problem with Jeff Flake. We had a problem with McCain, obviously. We had a problem with Susan Collins, Corker, um, one or two others. And 
what, what uh, McConnell asked Larry Kudlow and I to do is just go meet with them, each one of them. And we sat down, we sat down for an hour and a half with Bob Corker. Now we deserve combat pay for this, right, Mike? I mean, <laughs> sitting, sitting an hour and a half. But we sat there and we showed them these charts, we showed them the heritage research, because, and my, by the way, I think most of them wanted to get to yes, right? Mm -hmm. They wanted to vote for it, but they just needed to be persuaded that it was gonna work. And, you know, we just walked them through it. And, and at the end, I, I, one of the, another one of the best days of my life, I'll never forget it, after sp spending an hour and a half with Corker and just saying, we think this is gonna reduce the deficit because the economy is gonna grow. And at the end of the meeting, he said, okay, I'm a yes. And once, once he was a yes, I knew we had it. And the other one was Susan uh, Collins. I have to say, you know, we as conservatives sometimes, you know, criticize some of these moderate Republicans like Susan Collins. She was a hero on this. She was a hero. She was facing so much pressure in her home state, not, mm -hmm. you know, to vote against this. And she was heroically the last vote who voted for it. And Larry just walked her down from the cliff. I used to say, your two 70-year-olds are just having a love affair because they just, they, they were. <laughs> uh, so that was an example of just, you know, really working these guys and getting the 50 votes and a, an historic accomplishment. Yeah, yeah. Let me pick up from the the end of the campaign. By well, that you did time, the transition stuff. By that time, so at Treasury. Kay, Kay James, Ed Meese, right. Bill Walton, right. another member of our board of trustees, were all involved in the transition, had been yep. from uh, August of 16 when uh, we had a lot of empty desks in the transition in, August, in three months before the election, I'll tell you that. Uh, but we were there, and we were fighting the good fight, ready to put the pieces of the policy in place should somehow this right. miracle occur. Right. It actually did uh, the day after. We had a lot more friends than we did the week before. <laughs> right. Right. But we're, we're in there uh, producing the studies largely based on heritage publications yep. that we were bringing in day by day and distributing, it, di distributing them to uh, various people inside the transition uh, right through the whole system and working very closely with brand new members of the cabinet as they came in, we'd, we'd see, uh, you know, all of a sudden there was uh, Wilbur Ross or Betsy DeVos or somebody else coming in for the first time, and we'd have the opportunity to talk to them about their own area, and obviously this was one of the, the major issues. But let me jump ahead, mm -hmm. if I can. September, well, no, first, uh, BAT. <laughs> I forgot oh my about God. that. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. forgot about that. January 2017, uh, yep. pr President-elect Trump is still president-elect. Heritage has its annual Members of Congress conference in New York right. City. We had, I think, 41 or 42 members there. Uh, big part of the whole discussion was on what kind of tax bill will we have. This is the year it's got to happen, et cetera, et cetera. Kevin Brady, chairman of the Ways and Means Committee, is there. Kevin gets up, gives a positively eloquent plea for all the good things we want on tax policy, then throws in something called border adjusted tax, mm -hmm. BAT. And Moore and Fulner look at each other. <laughs> well, you know, what's he doing? Where's this coming from? Uh, anyway, we basically then mounted a, a full scale intellectual offensive since the Heritage Foundation, of course, never gets involved in telling members of Congress how to vote. Uh, we a full-throated uh, uh, intellectual battle uh, going around not only to Kevin but to other members of the Ways and Means Committee mm -hmm. uh, by, I guess it was about June, Ways and Means had pretty well worked through their bill. Uh, the bill came out with Brady's uh, okay. Uh, I was back at Heritage, now full-time, and uh, called Paul Ryan. I said, Paul, I just want you to know, Heritage loves the tax reform bill except for BAT. I mm -hmm. said, you got to get it out of there. He was a stickler uh, on that. Yeah, he was, yeah. because he had been chairman of Ways and yeah. Means, and he thought somehow this was going to give him a lot of extra revenue and all the rest. You and I and others went over, talked to him. We talked mm -hmm. to Brady. Sure enough, somewhere very soon thereafter, it got pulled out of the bill. Bill passes the House. And it would not have passed with the with, BAT. With the BAT. Right, right. No, no. And it would have been, much, if it right. had ever passed, it would have been much worse for... Yep for us and for the country. Um, fast forward, uh, September 25, uh, because of Paul Teller who's here and some other people, I'm invited to a small dinner with the president in the, in the blue room in the White House. Right. There are 20 of us, he's at the head of the table, I'm right next to him because I got more gray hair than anybody else, <laughs> and Kellyanne is next to me. And 
he gets up and he starts talking about how, you know, we got to get the Senate and I really need everybody around this table to go out and start uh, pitching this new tax bill. It's very, very important, and the only people out there who are talking about it right now are Mike Pence and me, and we need to have all of you amplifying our messages and getting the word out. And Excuse me, Mr. President. Yes, Ed. <laughs> I said, Mr. President, you said something a couple months ago that I really disagree with. What's that? <laughs> I said, uh, you said that you didn't want to have cabinet meetings let me tell you why you should, is if you talk to Ed Meese or other people, they'll tell you when Ronald Reagan was in office, he held regular cabinet meetings at least once a month, and he'd go in and he'd say, okay, this month the theme mm -hmm. is going to be tax cuts. So Betsy, if you're going to Harvard to talk about education reform, here's the one-page talking points. You'd spend the first five minutes talking about tax reform. Elaine Chow, if you're going out to L.A. to talk about infrastructure, same thing. He said... Reagan really do that? <laughs> I said, yes, sir, he really did. He looks, Kellyanne, yeah. call a cabinet meeting. Yeah. <laughs> so it, eight days later, about noontime, uh, my cell phone rang. Ed, this is Elaine Chow. I just want you to know I just came out of the Fulner cabinet meeting. <laughs> <laughs> Which, <laughs> well, you uh, know, there was I mean, <laughs> So, you know, he, he got the message. That's not the way you do business if you're in the real estate business. But that's what you have to do if you've got a whole cabinet sure. that's trying to convince the whole country where you want to go in policy. And you could tell stor stories like that in terms but of But let me just tell it, one, because yeah. I think this was another critical moment. So Republicans, you know, had decided at the beginning of 2017 that they were going to do Obamacare first, remember? And we were, uh, you know, I've, I'm all in on getting rid of Obamacare, but our point was, look, do, do both, you know? There's no reason you can't walk and chew gum at the same time, you know, do pursue both of these. Well, we come to the, to, I think it was around June or so, and we're nowhere on the tax bill, yeah, yeah. you know? And, um, and so we all huddled up, uh, you know, some of the guys at the Heritage Action and, and uh, the scholars at Heritage, and we're just thinking both about the economics and politics of this. And we, we just finally decided they've got to get going now because the policy, the, 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 uh, the idea back then was that they were going to potentially put off tax reform to 2018. And I got to tell you this. And, and so we had, well, you signed that letter. We yeah, had, yeah. you know, the four that you talked about, you and four or five other kind of leaders. And we wrote that piece in the New York Times yeah. where we said, Mr. President, why are you making tax reform so hard? Get going now. Well, uh, uh, Ivanka Trump calls me the morning that came out at nine o'clock in the morning. She said, I put that on Donald Trump's, I mean, on the president's, you know, his desk in the Oval Office. Well, tr President Trump reads that piece, he underlines it, he calls, you know, all of his, you know, minions in, uh, and he says, This is the way we got to do it. This is, we've got to get going right now. Now, that was important because I do believe, I, 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 I'm a pretty good student of politics. If they had waited till 2018, if they had not got that done before Christmas, it would not have happened. Yeah. You know, because the window closes so quickly on politics. So those were the kind of interventions that were really important in terms of, uh, and you know, what happens also is the, the enemy, you know, we were talking about this, Brian, about, you know, your enemies mount against you. So your yeah. time is against you. You gotta, you gotta strike while the iron is hot, and they did, and that's how, December, what was it, December 22nd? Is, was December the date 22 that, was the yeah, date the he test. signed it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, along the way we could, yeah. yeah that's right. Oh, I forgot one, one important thing. I mean, this is so important. And, and people, it's just this one um, little gem in the bill that I always forget to talk about. So one of the people's vote we had to get was Lisa Murkowski of Alaska. Do you know how we got Lisa Murkowski's vote? We got drilling for Anwar in Alaska. I mean, we've been trying to do that, Ed, for 30 years. And we asked, what does she want? She said, I want drilling. So sure, we'll put that in the bills. So we got the uh, Anwar drilling. Yeah. That's an issue. How long have we been working on that here? Yeah, 35 yeah, 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 yeah. Mid-Reagan. Did you all know yeah, that's yeah. in the bill, that we now can have drilling in Alaska? And the other one, of course, which you talked about earlier, was we got, uh, we got uh, McConnell deserves a lot of credit for this was we were trying to figure out how a way to raise revenue to pay for the tax cut. And so we did that by repealing the individual mandate on Obamacare. Yeah, yeah. So it was a threefer. We got the lowest tax rates in 30 years. We got rid of the individual mandate. We got drilling in Alaska. I mean, that's, yeah. a, that's quite a quite a quite Yeah, yeah, yeah. Someday we should do a, a further session maybe on the, the political maturation of Donald Trump. 
because you look at what happened the beginning of 2017 right. with repeal and replace when it was kind of, well, Ryan McConnell, send me something and yeah, I'll sign exactly. it, whatever it is. By the end of the year, he was up there exactly. two, three times a week. Exactly. He was talking to Susan Collins. You're right. Susan, what do you need to exactly. get on board the tax bill? That's so true. And, you know, he, he learned how Washington works that way, too, which was very important. Great point. And, Steve, here we are now, six months later. Uh, <laughs> here's one of my only prop for today. Oh, God. Front page of the Financial Times a week ago, the headline on the article is, IMF warns of world's $164 trillion debt pile and urges U.S. to reverse tax reductions. Yeah. Well, that's what we're up against. That's yeah, what we're yeah. up against. The so. damned IMF that we're subsidizing is telling us what to do with our tax policy. I was in uh, Korea beginning of this week. I gave a speech in defense of Trump and where Trump was. Afterwards, one of the first reactions, that, well, I got two. One was from David Sanger, the North Asia uh, bureau chief for New York Times, who stood up and said that, well, he certainly didn't agree with, with, with much of what I had said. It was nonetheless the best exposition of what Donald Trump's about that he had ever heard, <laughs> which I guess well was kind of mixed praise. Uh, <laughs> but then the former prime minister of Belgium grabs me in the hallway and said, <laughs> Oh, Dr. Fulner, I understand your position and all, but you know, if you would just repeal that tax cut, we could harmonize your tax rates with Europe's tax rates and we could all be back together again. <laughs> uh, yeah, Mr. Prime Minister, then we'd be back up there at 30%. Yeah, and we'd right. be like yeah, you exactly. with one and a half percent economic growth. Right. Uh, Belgium, by the way, is the highest taxed member of the OECD on the individual side, you know. Yeah. Yeah, but, my only point here is to everybody in the room, we have to keep fighting for what we've got now and start looking at the next phase. Well, we What's better, the next phase? We better do it because the Democrats are basically running against the, the tax cut, which I think is fine. I mean, let's make this refer a referendum on the tax cut. I mean, I was in Dallas last week, true story, and I'm walking down the street and this I passed this Hispanic woman and she, literally she came up to me, she did a double take, she goes, um, are you the one I see talking about, you know, economics on CNN or something? And I just kind of smiled and said, yeah. She goes, I just want to shake your hand. She said, I did not vote for Donald Trump. You know, I, I'm not for the, a lot of the policies you're, you're for. She said, but I just got a $1,500 bonus from my employer. And I was like, wow. And she said, uh, you know, she said, uh, and, and now, you know, I'm going to be able to take a vacation this year. Now, I don't know, I don't know what this woman makes. I bet she probably makes thirty or forty thousand dollars a year. Now, Nancy Pelosi thinks that the fifteen hundred dollars are crumbs, crumbs, you know. But for this woman, a fifteen hundred dollar pay raise is a big deal. And now, um, it was just announced uh, last week. We now have five million working class Americans who've gotten bonuses, bonuses. pay raises, or um, increases in their 401k plans yeah. as a result of, uh, of this plan. So it's, you know, I think the American people are seeing the benefits of this, and, but we, our crucial role, okay, we got to keep selling this. I mean, it doesn't stop. We've got to be the guardians of the tax bill and showing people the incredible, you know, benefits that, uh, that have, have accrued from this. Well, speaking of showing people. Uh, Steve was on CNN this morning. He's hosting the Larry Kudlow radio show, which will be tomorrow. Awesome. You're going to be on Meet the Press on Sunday. What else you got coming up? Anything? That's about it. Yeah, that's <laughs> about it for the next two days. Okay. Uh, so Steve's doing his fair share. But one of the neat things, I think, that, that undergirds what we've been saying is the key role that our fundamental ideas working through the institutional base that Heritage has, where we can marshal our, our resources, where we can pull the numbers together, give yeah, the exactly. numbers out to the policy it's makers, valuable. to the news media, et cetera, to really make the case and, and reinforce it so it isn't just the politicians out there talking about it. There's also some real academic credibility out there with it. I agree. And the other thing is, you know, that, as I said, we've been working on this for 30 years, but you always have to reteach these guys. You know? I mean, you know, it's a, there's always a new group of politicians coming in. They've, they're complete. So many of these guys have never even seen this stuff before. They, they have no idea. So it's a, it's a very a valuable thing. I don't know, by the way, another incredible statistic on the economy right now. Um, I mean, this is, look, I'm the most bullish guy on the U.S. economy out there. I, I think the economy is just firing on all cylinders right now. Uh, there, was a great, there was a great piece in the New York Times, uh, I think it was this morning or yesterday morning, that the American economy is overheating. 
Now, is that a wonderful <laughs> problem to have? You know, we have too, too much growth. Too many people are working. Six million more jobs in America today than people, than, than, um, than people can fill those jobs? I mean, is that a wonderful problem? <laughs> Six million jobs that, you know, we got to get people skilled to fill those jobs. But, you know, that gives a lot of bargaining power to employers. Kay, I'm going to be asking for a pay raise because, you know, there's, there's a lot of shortage of workers. But look, I mean, that is, that's, I want to make this last point if I could, and then we can take some questions. The left's parody of our tax plan was, it was for rich people. Yeah, yeah. And I, gotta t I love rich people. I want everybody to get rich, but that was not the intention of this bill. It truly was. I mean, every time we talked to Trump, he said, I don't want it. You know, I don't need a tax cut. This has to be for middle class people. I mean, Trump, you know, love him or hate him, he cares about those working class Americans. I mean, he just does. So Michigan, Ohio, Pennsylvania, people who are left behind. It was always to him about how do we give you know, higher pay to working class Americans who haven't had a pay raise in 15, 16 years. And that was the whole purpose of this. Create a tighter labor market, bring more capital in the United States so we have more investment here, not in Mexico and in China and, and other countries. And you'll create a labor market where workers can, can demand higher wages. And we're starting to see that already. And so this is, this is a middle class, Larry Kudlow always says this, by the way, Cutting business taxes is a way to help working class Americans. And remember Dick Armey, by the way? Oh, of course, yeah, yeah. He said this better than anybody. You know, Larry, nobody could turn a phrase better than, um, do, do you all remember Dick Armey? You know, he was fantastic. And he, he always used to say, liberals love jobs, but they hate employers. And it is so true. <laughs> I mean, you can't have jobs without employers. And that was what this was all about. It really Amen. was. Amen. Should okay. we take a couple of questions? Well, can we take a couple of questions? Sure. What's the, Two. the time situation? <laughs> Two questions. This was an extraordinarily optimistic meeting, a discussion. What do you think, and maybe in just a minute or two, had it been President Hillary Clinton, what do you think would be huh. Huh. Uh, You go. Uh, Armageddon? Okay, yeah, yeah. <laughs> what would have happened if, if it had been Hillary Clinton? Uh, none of the deregulation of the economy that we're seeing would have occurred, certainly. Uh, she she was made no bones about her fact her belief, Bob, that uh, taxes were already too low. We certainly had to in, in, increase the, the highest marginal rates and those fat cat businessmen, they certainly don't deserve a, a tax cut, which means there goes your jobs, there goes your economic growth and everything else. Would have been the exact opposite of where we are. Uh, the vote in 2016 really made a difference for a lot of people in the United States. Yeah. Uh, Yeah, somebody was just, uh, one of our donors at this meeting, I don't even remember who it was, just emailed me this morning saying, you know, what we ought to do is um, compare, you know, what Trump has done on taxes what, with what Bernie Sanders, you know, Hillary is yesterday, right? I mean, nobody cares about Hillary. Um, but, you know, we should compare, uh, you know, what, say, Bernie Sanders wants to do with what Trump. I mean, Bernie Sanders, at the, during the, remember in the campaign, he said we should go back to 70% tax rate. I mean, I'm not making this stuff up, 70%. Uh, you know, that's what uh, Elizabeth Warren is talking about. You know, and Elizabeth Warren is like Hillary Clinton without the charm. You know, I mean, she's, uh, so, um, you know, th those are the people we're going to be up against in 2020. Did you see, by the way, what Hillary said the other day about um, the Trump voters, by the way? She said that, uh, you know, the, the, that these were essentially stupid people who come from the areas where there's no dynamism in the economy. And she said, and she said they don't come from places like Connecticut and Illinois. Connecticut and Illinois are the <laughs> dynamic places in America? Come on, give me a break. Yeah, yeah. One more. Okay. Hey, Ed, Edwin. Oh, hello. <laughs> uh, so I agree that this would be a powerful... Uh, argument on which to run the next election, but perhaps even more powerful would be round two of tax cuts. Mm -hmm. The president's talked about it. Brady's talked about it. Uh, several of us talked to Mark Short, the legislative affairs man uh, for Trump last weekend. Uh, he's excited about it. What do you think the prospects are for round two, and can we get the individual rates addressed in a more adequate way yeah. in that round two? Um, you know, we got the highest rate down to 37% from 40, and that was a bloodbath just to get to 37%. Um, incidentally, the people at the very top, you know, those people in the top 1% who are paying that highest rate, do you know what they do for a living? Two-thirds of them 
own, operate, or invest in small businesses. So, you know, these are the small businesses in America that are getting those um, lower rates. Um, I would love to see a couple things. One is we've got to make the tax cut permanent, right? I mean, that's, that wasn't mm -hmm. done. Second of all, you know, we still didn't get rid of the Obamacare taxes. So the capital gains tax is still 24%. And we got to get that. We got to repeal um, the surtax in the Obamacare law that raised. Because remember, it was 15% under Bush. Then Trump raised it twice. He raised it to 20. The rate to 20. Obama, then he put a Obama. surtax on. So 24. Obama. We got to get, Obama the, we gotta get that capital yeah. gains tax done. Um, one thing, just on the way out, for those of you who didn't see it, you know, one thing to think about, you know, for those of you living in California and New York we did get rid of the state and local tax deduction. And that's a big deal in this bill because you know, we've capped it at $10,000. So if you live in California, New York, you know, either you know, your effective tax, your tax burden is, could go, your state tax burden can go up as much as 40 to 50%. Um, so that means two, one of two things have to either happen, either you know, uh, Jerry Brown and uh, Andrew Cuomo have to cut the rate or you better get the hell out of those states because you're, you know, the rates are going way up. And, and it is going to have a very negative impact on those states unless they change their tax system. But that's something I really insisted on in the bill, and, and Larry and Laffer did too. It's, it's a really good, it's, it never makes sense for one level of government to subsidize, subsidize another. And that's essentially what we're doing. So this will be a disciplining effect on state and local. And if you live in Florida and Texas, you know, the Yankees are coming. I mean, they are coming <laughs> because, you know, you have no income tax there. So yeah, yeah. great, great Please. achievement. Thank you, Kay, for letting Thanks, us Jay. do all this incredible work to, to make this happen. And you too, Ed. Thanks. Thanks, buddy. Thank you.